Hi everybody, it's Adam from Loose Pixel. I'm very happy you're here to join me on this month's Art Talk. Now this Art Talk has been a long time coming for numerous reasons. I recorded it and the video equipment didn't work properly. And then the audio equipment died because the battery died. And then I finally did record one that worked, but I wasn't totally satisfied with the message. Which is what brings us to today because I've had a long time to think about this. I want to share with you first the sources that led to today's art talk, the different things that inspired today's art talk. So number one was Jordan Peterson. He's a well-known Canadian smart guy who's very often invited to different things. He's worked as a teacher for many years and he's been invited to many different lectures and events sharing his opinion and his knowledge and expertise on these different topics. And sometimes what he talks about is controversial, sometimes not. I have my own unique opinion of him and what he shares and how he shares it. I want to both share some of the points he brought up and juxtapose those with my own. Elaborate on what he said because one of his lectures in particular brought up a lot of important points that I find are very worthy of discussion and exploration. The second thing that inspired this is something you might not know about me and that is the fact that I quit smoking back in 2015. Now how can Jordan Peterson and quitting smoking fit into the same category? Well, I learned some very important things when it came to quitting smoking. Certain psychological things that I had to address and be aware of and formulate an opinion on in order to quit. And not only quit, but quit easily and quickly. So that's number two. And the third is the fact that I've been working both as an independent artist as an entrepreneur, running my own business, my online school, and I've even run other little amateur businesses off on the side as well. And I've worked as a professional in studios. So I'm very much aware of these two different worlds, these two different headspaces, these two different approaches to working professionally. And I wanna bring all of this into a potpourri of thought and ideas to share with you today. So let's start with Jordan Peterson. In one of his particular talks, one that one of my students had brought up again a few weeks after I discovered him during one of our private sessions, and he brought to my attention, oh, there goes the duck. I'm gonna get him on film one day, believe you me. I've been trying to film him for the last three weeks and he keeps getting away on me. Keeps, he keeps taking off the moment i just about to hit that record button. But with that said, in one particular lecture, I'm not sure which university he was at, maybe the University of Toronto or maybe even Concordia University here in Montreal, I'll have to double check that. But he talks about what it's like to be a creative person in a creative world and how he makes a comparison between creative and industrial people. I'll link the, I'll link the lecture below so you can watch the whole thing, it's quite interesting. And in it, in very classic Jordan Peterson style, he definitively says, this is what it's like to be a creative, this is what it's like to not be a creative. Industrial people think like this, creative people think like that. And in many ways, he's right. He, a lot of important points that he brings up are true. They're, they're, I, I can't disagree with them, so to speak. One of the things that Jordan Peter discusses is the difference between creative and industrial people. People who have a more industrial headspace versus people who have more of a creative headspace. And he describes one of those key differences as being creative people are risk takers. They thrive in the unpredictable, in the spontaneous, which is extremely true. I very much agree with that. And in comparison, more industrial type jobs, more industrial type people are more set and regimented in their ways. Their work model is far more regimented predictable and based off of predetermined criteria, information. And the more information, the more detailed information industrial people can fit into their brains, be them doctors or be them lawyers or accountants or whatever the case might be, the generally the more effective they are at their job, given the right moral compass, of course, right? <laughs> some people can use it for good, some people can use it for bad. But all in all, more information equals more competence in your particular field. And that information does grow over time, but it's an evolution of already existing information. Now, the same can be said for creativity. Myself as a teacher have learned things from my predecessors and I teach that to my students who evolve that into the next thing. However, the artistic process is very unique to the individual. Because art is not only an accomplishment of the mind, it's an accomplishment of the mind and the body and the heart, our personality, our lifestyle, our beliefs, politically, socially, personally, sexually, all play into 
the type of art that we produce, our unique brand of art. So there are as many different brands of art, many different venues and creative ways of going about your own profession as there are people on this planet because it's unique to us and our particular personality. Now this is where Jordan Peterson says, industrial and creative people have a very hard time mixing. Creative people, for instance, are very difficult to manage, he says. They're very difficult to be a creative person because how, what kind of a niche do you fit into? How do you, mark, how do you create a repeatable, sustainable, predictable work model based off of a creative job such as art and painting, what we do on this channel? How do you do it? It's very difficult. And this is why very often any industrial type of system, whether you're working for a corporate company or you're working for an artistic studio, you are in essence, any employer in essence is taking a chance with you. Is this artist going to be able to produce the type of work that we want them to produce in a repeatable fashion, in a timely fashion, at a volume that we need in order to produce our work? So whether or not you're working for a corporate company or for an artistic company, that model is still an industrial model. And this is where Jordan Peterson stops. This is where he kind of cuts the conversation and says, this is why artists are doomed. He likes to say things like that, right? Or, I don't know, I'm not necessarily repeating what he's saying verbatim. He might not have necessarily said that, but that's kind of where he was leaning. You know, artists are like this. This is what they are, and this is the unfortunate circumstances, and this is why artists are never gonna find any kind of success or happiness in their life. And that's just the bottom line, and it's, and it's tragic, but it's true. Yet they are the people who fashion and create this world that we live in for more industrial people to take over. The way he describes it is creative people create different situations. They create jobs, so to speak. They'll create an industry. And once they're done, a creative person is done at that point, and they move on to the next thing. And all of the industrial people flood in and take over the role, leaving all of the creative people unemployed. And this is where I feel that thought was limited. This is where I feel I need to contribute to this, being somebody who works in probably one of the most strictly creative jobs there are, i.e. visual arts, right? And what I feel this limitation is, is in categorizing, like Jordan Peterson likes to do, categorize artists as being that. Women are like this, men are like that. This is what men look for, this is what women look for. This is what makes an ideal this, this is what makes an ideal that, this is what makes a perfect creative person, this is what makes a perfect industrial person. He just kind of sticks everybody in a category. And the reality is, we're not all built the same. Some artists are more industrial minded, some artists are less industrial minded. And this is a very important distinction to make because this defines your, your particular business model. There is no one set business model for anybody. Some people fit into an industrial model, some people don't. Take an artist like Scott Robertson. Take an artist like Feng Zhu. To name just a few little fraction of the people out there, out of the millions and millions of artists out there. One of the things that makes them very employable is the fact that their business model is based off of a pre-set criteria. Feng Zhu, Scott Robertson are very technical-minded artists. Their art is based off of a very sustainable, technical, repeatable, mathematical formula. Now, as such, when they're producing their artwork, they're always aware of what that outcome is gonna be. Their artwork is in no which way, shape, or form a new perspective on the world around us. It's not an artistic perspective, it is a technical design. So when, when they sit down at the drafting table, they know exactly what their mandate is, they draw it, they execute it, they do so in a very satisfactory fashion, they deliver it off, and everybody's happy. And they produce beautiful stuff, don't get me wrong. But the way they think is a very industrial-minded type of headspace. Now, from all of the students that I've taught both in schools and online, from all the colleagues that I've had and artistic friends that I've had and artistic family that I have, the industrial mind makes up for this much of the big picture. And everybody else is not an industrial mind, or at least we lean towards a less industrial headspace. However, the irony in all of this is the fact that every single one of these non-industrial minded artists are all trying to fit into that studio. They're trying to all fit into Blizzard or EA or Riot Games or CD Projekt Red or they're all trying to fit into this small little niche that really in all due honesty in most part belongs to a more industrial minded artist. And this is one of the reasons why there is such a small short list, a tiny little short list of these hyper qualified artists that fit into these particular jobs that everybody else wants. So everybody goes out and idolizes Scott Robertson and idolizes Feng Zhu, which 
they shouldn't be, at least not in terms of employment. As far as artwork is concerned, yeah, I, absolutely, they're worth your praise, they're worth your love. But, but when it comes to a business model, that's where you're cutting yourself short. And the reason why this is so important for me to bring up with you is because being a teacher who's taught students of every different age, I've seen students that have wasted decades and decades of their lives trying to get the training and skill they need to be able to work at a company like Blizzard, for instance. But when I open up their portfolio and I look at it, I think to myself, why would you even apply to Blizzard? I'm looking at beautiful artwork and decades of it. I mean, we're talking amazing skill, yet none of it is suitable for Blizzard. I don't see any stuff that's got a cart classical animation uh, reference to it through the three-dimensionality isn't there uh, you know the rendering is far more realistic or far more playful or far more of an ink line type of drawing I'm not seeing anything that looks at all blizzardy not only that the, the actual subject itself the narrative the your target market is more for children or it's more hardcore or it's more this or that but it's not blizzard it's definitely not blizzard and they have been struggling with unemployment trying to get into that job and they've been wasting precious time when they should be investing it into doing something completely different. Jordan Peterson said, artists have a hard time being employed. No. Artists have a hard time being employed by industrial model companies. Artistic minds, like Jordan Peterson said himself, are creative minds. They are designed to create. Yet, one of the things that I find absolutely remarkable is these incredibly creatively gifted artists are trying to fit into an industrial model. You should not be trying to fit into an industrial model. You should be trying to create a model. That's your job. Artists of this type should be focusing as much of their energy towards their art, towards fashioning and creating their own employment at the same time. They should be entrepreneurs. They should be designing work that fits and is custom made to their particular brand, their particular aesthetic, their particular beliefs. That's what they should be doing. But instead, they try to fit into some other predetermined model. They try to fit into some other company. You're doing it wrong. And even if you do manage to be one of those one in a million artists that squeeze through the gate ever so, ever so carefully and rush for the front door and get in before that door slams, and you get into that company, there's a very good chance you're gonna be fired very soon after because you're not gonna fit in, because you can't sustain that type of model, because, because you evolve, because you feel this way, because you're more this way on this day and more this way on another day. So that's the first thing. You need to be focusing your energy towards how do I build my own business? How do I market myself? How do I get my artwork out there? How do I get known? How do I gain popularity? How do I find clients? What type of, how can I bring my particular brand of art to the market out there. How do I market myself? This is what you should be focusing on. And you might be saying, yeah, but Adam, not everybody has a business mind. Not everybody has a gift for, for creating business. To that I say, you don't have a gift at thinking industrially. Now here's part two, which is extremely important. As a professional, as an artist, what makes us artists of any kind, be it dance or singing or, or visual arts or cooking or any of these things, one of the things that make you the artist that you are is that you are very diverse. You have the ability to be able to take different facets of your life, be it law, be it medicine, be it mechanics, be it landscaping, be it quantum physics, be it any of these things, and be able to manipulate those things into this little ball, this little sphere called my world. Everything that you are, everything that makes you who you are, goes behind the type of art that you produce. Well, that same thing should apply to your artwork. But what happens when you work in a studio? I know, I've done this for many years. They look at you and they say, oh, okay, you're capable of doing a thousand things, but we don't give a shit about any of that stuff. We want you to do character designs, these types of character designs. And we want you to do this for as long as you're working for us. Maybe you might do a little something else. Maybe if you have an affinity for doing environments as well, maybe we, you might get some space in there. But we're hiring you for that. And this is what you're gonna be doing for as long as you're working for us. If you're lucky, however, you might get a management job, in which case you won't be able to draw at all. So <laughs> you might as well just stick to doing the character designs. And you'll get really good at doing that particular thing. And because you're building that skill, the next company that hires you 
well, they're going to want to hire you for the same thing. This is one of the traps that I found myself in my own career. I was really good at cartooning. But at a certain point, I didn't want to do that strictly anymore. I wanted to move more into concept art and illustration. But because I had such a strong cartoon influence in my artwork, it was very difficult to break. So all of these serious concept art companies didn't, didn't give me the time of day, but I kept getting offered these stupid jobs doing animation for the types of animation that I wasn't even particularly interested in. So I was like, well, I was very frustrated with that. I was forced into a niche when I felt I was a lot more than that. So this is something you have to realize as well. When you're creating a business, it doesn't only utilize one skill or one little facet of skills. It uses all of you. You want to be able to exploit every skill you have because that's what makes you unique and that's what makes you powerful, okay? Now, number two has to do with smoking. How does it have to do with smoking? Well, back when I was working at Electronic Arts, I was working as an artistic director. One of my direct colleagues who worked right next to me, the creative director, Ollie Sykes, had quit smoking. We were kind of smoking buddies. We used to go outside and have a cigarette outside. And one day he decided to quit. And when he quit, he said, Adam, you know, quitting smoking is the easiest thing in the world I've ever done. Quitting smoking is a piece of cake. It is easy. And don't believe any of the hype that it's not, it is. It's a completely easy thing to do. You can do it like that without even thinking twice about it. And I completely believed him. And I completely agreed with him. And it also made me think, because come 2015, when I made that decision to quit, I had Ollie's voice in my head saying, quitting smoking is the easiest thing in the world to do. But I also had something else. I had a couple of years to think about what he had said. And I thought to myself, to whose benefit is it for you to believe that quitting smoking is the hardest thing in the world to do? And some people have even gone as far as saying it's more addictive than cocaine, which I think kind of ludicrous because I don't know many people who sold their car or murdered their kids for a cigarette. <laughs> It'd have to be a very special kind of addiction there. But to whose benefit is it for you to believe that? Well, think about it. Which industry out there does zero marketing, it's illegal to do marketing, either online or on TV, or they're not allowed to have celebrities endorsing their product, they even have to put warning labels with disgusting pictures of gum disease and, and black lungs and you know sudden infant death syndrome and all these different types of things on their packaging itself, yet still manage to get through all of that and make trillions and trillions of dollars a year. Tobacco companies. How do they do that? By getting you hooked really young when you're feeling particularly rebellious against the rules such as, you know, smoking is going to cause lung cancer. Oh yeah? Screw you, I'm going to do it anyways and going out and buying a pack of cigarettes and getting themselves addicted to cigarettes. And then spending the next 50 years convincing them that when they quit, it's going to be the hardest thing in the world to do. I was pre-programmed to believe that quitting smoking was the hardest thing to do before I even anywhere, went anywhere near a cigarette. So by the time I got, found myself going to the store and buying myself a pack of cigarettes on my own, which didn't take long, took a couple of months maybe from smoking my first cigarette to going and buying my first pack to have already come to terms with the fact that this was going to be one of the hardest things in the world to quit. And I smoked for 20 years following that. I never really tried to quit, mind you, but when it was time for me to quit for real, serious, in 2015, I quit. And it was a piece of cake. Within two, three weeks, I wasn't even thinking about it. And I look back now, two and a half, almost three years later at being a non-smoking and, and find it almost surreal to think that I used to smoke. I can hang around, around, I could hang around smokers and have them blow smoke right in my face and I never once went, oh, that would be nice. No, not once. It's in the past and it's gone and it was absolutely easy. We pre-program ourselves. We program ourselves all the time to believe certain things. And one of the things that the artistic industry, us as artists, have been programmed to believe is, number one, art is a starving career. It is a struggling career. You're going to struggle to make a living. You're going to struggle to survive. You're going to be broke. You're going to have bill collectors after you. I was told this from an artistic family, from an artistic mother, in an artistic world, in an artistic school, everywhere I went, this little dark cloud of failing life, this little dark cloud of poverty and struggle floated over my head. And I never even stepped into the professional world yet. What I'm telling you today is, the reason why this rumor still spreads is because the world has not caught up with modern society. If you wanted to succeed as an independent artist 40, 50 years ago, 30 years ago, even 20 years ago, almost impossible to do without some good financing from the government, without a space 
to pay rent, you know, some commercial rented space for you to run your business from, if not running it from home. You'd have to be paying business taxes for a certain section of your house that you were using towards business. To being able to get a lawyer or an accountant to be able to get all these things done, to be able to do the marketing for you, to maybe get in marketing. I mean, it was unattainable for most people, especially for people who are, who are in an industry that wasn't paying them a lot. But that's not the case anymore because you can do all of the above yourself for free or almost for free, you can start your own YouTube channel, you can start your own website, you can run your own business and build your own business, you can build your own website and you can design it because hell, you're the artist. You don't have to pay for the art, you get, all, you get that service for free and it's customized to your specific taste and aesthetic. What kind of budget equipment do you need to use to start off a business? You do not need expensive equipment. The expensive equipment comes in later on if needed once your business is already kicked off the ground and you start to build yourself up and get better stuff, get better, better audio, get better video, that kind of idea. But you can do all of these things yourself. You can learn how to do basics in HTML in days. From there, the only thing you have to pay for is a web host server if you want to get a website online, if that's something you choose to do. Learning the basics of HTML, learning how to manipulate code or creating code is incredibly easy. You can get templates for three bucks on the online that, that is cross compatible against all different types of platforms. Beautiful platforms, they're dirt cheap, you pay one time, you've got that website, you can edit it to your heart's content, you can update the content to your heart's content, it barely costs you a penny. How to put together a YouTube channel, how to work camera equipment, how to work audio equipment, what type of audio and video equipment do you want to get? What kind of lighting should you get? Should you use indoor or outdoor lighting? All of these different types of things you need to market yourself, to get your name out there, are all stuff you can do yourself right now for near nothing. Of course, if you want some kind of tips, if you want a little head start on what kind of audio and video equipment to use, how to use this type of equipment, all these different types of things, any questions you might have about getting yourself up and running, let me know in the comments below and I'll make a video on it. But there's tons of content out there that can teach you that kind of stuff for free. It's called YouTube. We've got this endless resource of knowledge and ability that we can do absolutely for free. For artists, we are in the golden age of modern art right now, where we can create our own business, we can create our own brand, and we can succeed for near nothing. Take advantage of it right now, because you have access to this type of stuff. You can create your own world, your own aesthetic, your own beliefs. You, you can create your own business like that. I didn't learn how to start my own business through Lucid Pixel. I originally realized that I could create my own business when I was completely broke, I didn't have a job, I decided, hell, I'm a part of the swing and jive dance community. And within three weeks, I had found a venue, a beautiful two floor location with beautiful dance floor and a beautiful old school bar and pool tables downstairs. I got myself a sound technician. I got myself DJs, live bands, music, lighting, and did all the advertising online, networked with all of the different swing and jive dance communities, and networked myself with all the different swing and jive dance schools around Montreal, had them all collaborate to do some help do some marketing as well, even got some schools to work things out that hadn't been getting along for years. And within the space of a month, opened the doors and hundreds of people started flooding in, and I made a ton of cash. And you know how much money I had to start off with? That much. Zilch. Zero. All I had was an idea. I was a creative person, I was resourceful, I had a moral code that everybody gets paid, and I did it. This is something that you are equally capable of doing. You just have to realize, you don't have to fit into any clicks out there anymore. You create your own clicks. that's what you're designed for. You now have the resources to be able to do all of this on your own. You'll have a sustainable, stable lifestyle, and this isn't some business, you know, how to make a million bucks in five days kind of bullshit. No, this is, some, this is something that I've done myself for absolutely nothing, something you can do as well. So I really recommend you give it a lot of thought. But don't pre-program yourself to believe that it's a dead-end industry. It's not a dead-end industry at all. In fact, a lot of specialists have been saying for years, a lot of these industrial style jobs are being replaced with AI because it's based off of already pre-existing data and creative jobs are the only ones that are nowhere close to being replaced by AI because, well, computers can't keep up with the creative mind. It's too diverse, it's too complex, it's too spontaneous. So take advantage of that reality because moving forward, our world as artists is going wonderful, wonderful places. We're not living under that same dark cloud of doubt and poverty that our predecessors have had to deal with, or at least believed they had to deal with. Moving forward, we're in a very, very good place 
starting right now. All right, so thank you very much for joining me today on this month's Art Talk. Uh, don't forget, I put out a new behind the scenes video every single Monday, so don't miss that, as well as the Brush Sauce Theatre Art Contest with myself and Tyler Edlin every single month. And, and before I forget, one of my giftedly industrial and artistic ex-students who I say with a grain of salt because I'm going to be taking his class soon, he's an absolutely amazing artist, started his own YouTube channel called Cutting Sketch Designs. It's kind of new, but amazingly pro. <laughs> that Both the quality of his work and his production value is absolutely amazing. And the content that he shares is incredibly valuable. I already went out and bought three books based on his recommendation. I watch his tutorials all the time. He's absolutely amazing. I'm gonna leave all of these links in the description below. So don't hesitate, definitely go check it out and subscribe right away to his channel. It's absolutely amazing. All right, so happy painting everybody and take care.